Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. The legend of Bigfoot puts hunting for evidence of the Sasquatch. Is, is, is that... I always get this confused with the, the name. The Zara Pruder film is the Kennedy one, but there's also that one, isn't it? Or is it the Bigfoot one? Because there's that Bigfoot footage, which is... I was like, look, look, it's Bigfoot. It's like, bruh, it's a man in a suit. What are you talking about? It could have been more obvious. It's, it's, that's the best you got. That's the best. Other than all the fake footprints that people left behind. Look, what happens here if you're new? One of my writers, in this case, Casey, has written me a script. Thank you, Casey. Um, I, I don't think this is real. Please, you promised me you'd give it a chance. <laughs> Let's see in the next 20 pages whether Katie convinces me otherwise. Let's jump in. Ahoy, mateys, Sasquatch hunters, Whistler and Watson reporting for duty. Yes, that's Katie Watson, by the way. Also, the last person in the class to be called. <laughs> Today, we will be attempting to track down the mysterious Bigfoot, investigating reports, providing alternative theories, and taking a deep dive into the most famous Bigfoot footage of all time. Is the man in the seat, isn't it? It's clear. And I swear to God, wasn't there a dude who came out later and was like, bro, it was me, I was the guy in the suit, and everyone was like, no, you weren't. <laughs> And it was like, it was him. And there was like the guy who filmed it or whatever admitted that it was fake or something like that. Look, I don't want to spoil the story. Let's carry on. Sorry, sorry. With proponents and critics on either side of this cryptid's case, on what side of the line do you stomp your presumably not fake foot? Katie, that's a bit discriminatory to all the people who have like, you know, blades for legs or whatever. I guess they're not really fake blades, but they're not feet, are they? <laughs> Come on, Katie. Let's be a bit more PC. What about the people with blades? Like that, that dude, Pistorius who, I don't want to say, because I haven't done the casual criminalist yet, but we've got a casual criminalist on him coming up. Did he go to prison for murder? Or like at least manslaughter or something, right? <laughs> and he had bladed legs. He didn't use the blades on his legs for the murder. They, no, look, let's just leave this. This isn't the channel. This is a channel where we're looking at Bigfoot, not Pistorius or Pistorus or whatever his name was and his blade legs. Bigfoot, the monster, the myth, the legend. Let's get some background info on this big fella before we go starting and poking around in his territory. What we refer to as Bigfoot today is one of the heavy hitter cryptids that has existed in a recognizable form throughout history and also in different areas of the world. Lots of cultures have some sort of large hairy ape-like man or man-like ape in their folklore traditions with the Himalayan Yeti, Chinese hairy man, and Australian Yowie also seeming to be some sort of distant Bigfoot relatives. For the longest time, I thought, like, a Yeti. You guys ever played that game Ski Free? It was, like, back on, like, I don't know, Windows 3.1 or whatever it was back in the day. It was, like, one of those games that comes bundled with it, like Minesweep or whatever. And you're skiing this dude down a mountain. It's, like, this little pixelated dude. Just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And then uh, once you, like, get... You, you avoid crashing into trees and all that stuff. And then at the bottom, like, so the game doesn't, like, go on forever... Uh, a yeti runs out of the corner and eats you. And to me, I can't remember if it was actually a robot or if it looked like a robot. Um, but it was, I think it was a yeti. I think that was actually lore of the game was that it was a, it was a yeti. And for the longest time, I thought a yeti was a robot. Like, I mean, not as an adult <laughs> or like even an older child, but as a child, I thought for the longest time that yeti meant robot, like some sort of monstrous robot <laughs> that eats skiers. Today's subject hails from North America, with another name for it being Sasquatch. It might be that technically the being known as Sasquatch and what is now called Bigfoot are two different things, but for all intents and purposes, as they both refer to large, hairy, bipedal beings, we'll use the terms interchangeably, mainly because Sasquatch is often shortened to Squatch, uh, which I found funny, and will likely pepper liberally throughout this script. You might also be wondering where the word Sasquatch comes from in the first place. Oh my god, I was wondering exactly that, Katie, you're reading my mind! Oh, because I care. <laughs> You've hurt my feelings very much indeed. Sorry. Why so cynical, Simon? Why do you have to be such a dick? Well, it's apparently an anglicized version of Sasquets, meaning something like hairy man, in the language of the Stahalis people from the sovereign coast Salish First Nation. This is an area of British Columbia in Canada, and they're still leaning heavily into this today with their website logo being a stylized version of something that is presumably a Sasquatch. The version of the cryptid has supernatural abilities, woo, including the power to shapeshift. That sounds real, and is generally as, uh, as seen as a peaceful protector of the forest. British Columbia makes up part of the Pacific Northwest, an area that is the traditional hive of Squatch activity, and also includes the US states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. I know about this place, because I watched that TV show. Um, what's it called? When they drop those people alone? <laughs> oh, it's called Alone! They drop them on, like, it's in Canada or America. It's like in that like northwesty part where it's like cold and Canadian and stuff. And 
they drop them there and they're like, all right, then have fun. And they just got to survive in the woods. And then they have to, why am I describing this TV show? It's quite a laugh in a kind of like horrible way because it does seem really miserable. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm just watching that show and it's like, wow. Like, I, I know, I, I imagine most people watch the show and they're like, wow, it'd be nice to get into nature. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm glad I'm inside <laughs> eating a pizza that I didn't make. You know, it just makes me appreciate that. While large hairy humanoid figures have been captured in tribal artworks and oral histories for centuries, it wasn't until the 1950s that Bigfoot as we know him really hit the scene. In 1958, a company was chopping down trees in the Six Rivers National Forest in northwestern California when one of their number, Jerry Crew, noticed some truly massive and deep footprints in the mud. It came out that other men had also noticed large prints recently. They theorized that whatever had made the prints may also have been responsible for the hitherto unexplained movings of a massive oil drum and a very large vehicle construction tire. Dude, if you're like out in the woods dropping down trees and you see a massive ass footprint, you mentioned it to the guys. Oh yeah, I saw those too, Jim. And it's like, well, why you fucking mention it? That is probably hunting us right now. <laughs> Crew was convinced something weird was happening. I was going to say a foot, but I didn't want to sully the story with a crappy pun. You did though, Katie, didn't you? I couldn't resist. And eventually managed to get a plaster cast made out of one of the footprints. It measured 16 inches long or 40.6 centimeters, uh, which for context is bigger than Shaquille O'Neal's size 23 basketball shoes, or at least according to the website themeasureofthings.com, just over a third of Danny DeVito. <laughs> TheMeasureOfThings.com sounds like a really useful website. This larger-than-life cast, along with Jerry Crew's belief in the presence of something around the camp, led to headlines and photos in a variety of newspapers. The San Francisco Chronicle punned all over it and stole my joke with the headline, Big Feet of Foot, while the province paper titles their piece, New Sasquatch Found, above a photo of Jerry Crew holding his plaster cast, and underneath it it says, It's called Bigfoot which kind of makes it look like Jerry himself is the creature in question. Jerry's like, hey, what the fuck, paper? Things escalated in the Humboldt Standard with eyewitnesses see Bigfoot and an apparent photo scoop of three men squatching down, ah, uh, ah, uh, sorry, squatting down around a deep uh, foot impression with plaster. While the men of the logging company referred to the being as Bigfoot, two words, journalists at the time thought that the one-worded Bigfoot, one word, made for snappier copies, so this became the name that we all know and love today. Since the spawn of the 20th century Bigfoot, there have been literally thousands of sightings or encounters with the wild hairy ape man recorded uh, with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. That doesn't sound like a phenomenal waste of time, does it, guys? <laughs> does it? And plotted on the Bigfoot Mapping Project website. Thanks to all the research and witness testimonies, here's what we know about the mysterious being. Yeah, no is a very, uh... Very uh, loose word there, isn't it? Bigfoot is much taller than the average human. Sightings are variously pegged at anywhere between 7 and 11 feet, or between 2 meters and 3.3 meters tall. If you're wondering how many Danny DeVitos it is, yes, Katie, that's exactly what I was wondering. It's anywhere from 1.3 to 2.3 Danny DeVitos tall. Brilliant. Why would... Da I've no idea how tall... I know Danny DeVito is short, but I uh, he's, it's not a, like... It's not a good comparison. <laughs> also, I don't know how big Shaquille O'Neal is, other than he's big. I don't even really, I can't even really conceptualize a size 23 shoe. I'm like size 10. What's that in American? I think, oh, I'm size 44 European, which is what I'm more used to now. I think we do, I think size 10 is size 11 in the US, something like that, normal size. So does that mean Shaquille's feet are two and a bit times bigger than mine? That sounds unrealistic, doesn't it? And I know like a size... A size, a size 5 is not half a size 10, because a size 5, your foot would be like this big. You'd be like a tiny-footed person. You couldn't even walk around on feet. This is like the size of my children's feet. Um, what are we talking about? Oh yes, Danny DeVito. While none has been affable enough to step on a scale, it's estimated that the average weight of such a squad would be around 650 pounds or 295 kilos. I don't know how many Danny DeVitos this is, and it's not considered polite to talk about people's weight, but I'm pretty sure it's more than one. Hey Siri, how much does Danny DeVito weigh? Every time I ask Siri, every single time, it's always like, I'll find some web results. Hold on. I installed this thing on my phone that allows me to WhatsApp with um, ChatGPT. So let's ask it, how much, let's actually just use the voice thing because look, we're doing the job that Siri can't. Uh, how much does Danny DeVito weigh? Well, I thought I meant weigh. Why would you think I mean W-A-Y? How much does Danny DeVito weigh? Answer my question. Come on, come on. 
This is a very neat thing. I'm not sure about the current weight of Danny DeVito, but according to some sources, he's four feet, 10 inches tall. Wow, Danny DeVito's really small. Wow, okay. See, even that is a much more satisfying answer than Siri. God damn, Siri. Apple, you gotta buy this uh, chat GPT thing and just put it into Siri because the world would just be a better place, wouldn't it? Bigfoot is bipedal, i.e. walks upright on two legs. It's generally agreed to be a non-human primate and covered in hair, ranging anywhere from black, brown, reddish, and gray, and some albino Bigfoots have also been recorded. The North American Bigfoot prefers to live in forested areas, but can occasionally be found in swamp or marshlands. It creates nests to sleep in and is an omnivore, with a diet consisting of anything from roadkill to tree shoots. It's le it is capable of killing larger prey such as deer or bears with ease, and tends to eat the internal organs such as the liver fur. I know this is all like self people reporting like their stories that they made up and all that shit, but like taking down a bear? Bears are big. I've seen bears. I mean, in zoos and stuff, not in real life, because then I'd be really, that'd be a story, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, but, but taking down a bear, holy shit. While often thought of as solitary creatures, family groups of Bigfoot have been observed, including males, females, and babies. Like other apes, Bigfoots groom each other and beat their chests in shows of aggression or to assert dominance. <laughs> While there have been no direct attacks on humans, at least in the last century, Bigfoots may attack and kill aggressive animals such as dogs. However, they tend to leave livestock or farm animals alone. Many people report extreme feelings of fear, apprehension, and anxiety during a Bigfoot encounter. <laughs> yeah, so you're like, oh, sh Ah, it's big, it's aggressive, and it's like something its chest like King Kong. You're like, I'm dead, I'm so dead, how did I survive? Over 10% of reports also make mention of a powerful smell coming off the Bigfoot, which is the similar which is similar to the ability of male gorillas who can control the type of smell they give off under some circumstances. I can control the type of smell I give off, but if I exercise really hard and don't shower, there's gonna be a different kind of smell to if I do. If I let out a big fart, if I eat some like really smelly food and they have a big burp. It's very pleasant all of this, isn't it? Like I've been drinking lots of black coffee this morning. You might be able to tell because I feel absolutely hopped the it up on caffeine. Um, I feel like this is quite lively. But if I had a big burp right now, you probably could smell the coffee. Like I had went to the dentist yesterday and my new dentist is by my office rather than by my home. And normally I brush my teeth before going to the dentist like a good human being, but I didn't have a toothbrush at work and I had like Asian food for lunch. And so I was like trying to drink water and get the smell out of my mouth because I don't want to be that person who goes to the dentist with a stinky mouth because I'm sure the dentist doesn't like it. And I'm just like, they're just like trying to breathe through my nose as much as possible because I'm self-conscious about it for some reason. It's a dentist. This is your job. I'm sure like my teeth are nice. They're all like, you know, clean and white. I brush them twice a day. I use those bloody interdental toothbrush brushes, which sometimes make me bleed and are a nightmare. I do the dental hygiene. Shit. So I, I'm sure the person who goes in next is like, has like four teeth and the rest is just gums with infection. And so that's, that's going to be more unpleasant, right? Than like slight Asian breath. Not like Asian. That sounds weird. That sounds slightly racist, doesn't it? <laughs> I meant like Asian food. It was Vietnamese food. I had a bun cha. It's like this fried pork dish. It's delicious. There's a good Asian restaurant. There's in fact two good Asian restaurants right in my office. He's gone, hasn't he? Oh my God, what are we talking about? I'm sorry. I've had way too much coffee. I really have. I'm really sorry. Bigfoots are known for their strength, easily tossing large rocks at intruders, uprooting small trees, and messing with large and heavy items in places like construction or logging sites. At night, they are known to shake trees, snap twigs and branches, and make knocking noises on logs or trees. It's not known whether this is to communicate with other Bigfoots or to freak out the poor campers huddled in the flimsy tents. Even more creepily, they are capable of a wide range of vocalizations, anywhere from whistling to deep growls and roars to piercing screams. So screaming animals is kind of terrifying, isn't it? Have you seen those goats screaming? That's the only nice kind of screaming from animals, and it's still kind of terrifying. I like imagine just walking along, and there's a bear, and it roars, and then it screams. You'll be like, oh my god, bears got even more scary! But roar! <laughs> oh, f me! Get out of here! Famous Bigfoot examples. Okay, now we know about the big fella, let's take a look at some of the more famous examples of sightings. We've already mentioned Jerry Crew's OG experience. Let's fast forward to the more widely recognized, the possibly only Bigfoot footage of all time. The Patterson film, the Patterson-Gimlin film, it's not the Zara Pruder film, that is the Kennedy one. 
1967. Around the same period, though. You've probably seen the footage, a clip of it, a screenshot, or at least some sort of meme about it. The whole thing is just under a minute long and allegedly shows a female Bigfoot walking away from Roger Patterson, looking back a few times before walking into the forest. Roger Patterson and his friend Bob Gimlin had been actively seeking out Bigfoots after Patterson had become interested in them several years earlier. They headed to Bluff Creek in the Six Rivers National Forest in Northern California, as there had been recent sightings and Patterson had visited the area before. This was also the same forest where Jerry Crew had discovered large footprints some nine years prior. Riding along the creek bank on horseback, Patterson and Gimlin all of a sudden came across a large bipedal creature on the other side of the creek, or crick, if you watch an interview with Gimlin. <laughs> Oh, he's just got a weird accent or something. Realizing that they had happened upon a Sasquatch, Patterson spent several seconds getting his camera out of his saddlebag while instructing Gimlin to get his gun out just in case, although they weren't there to hunt or kill the Bigfoot. You can see that some of the film's footage has been taken on the move, with Patterson stumbling and trying to keep the creature in sight. He was mere meters away at his closest points. Oh, he was? I didn't... I, I, was, he, was he so close? Okay. He was using a 16mm camera, and frame 352 of the short reel, uh, where the creature turned to look at him, captured the now iconic image of Bigfoot in motion and was the jumping off point for Bigfoot mania. After just under a minute of tracking the creature along the creek and into the trees, Patterson ran out of film. After reuniting with Bob Gimlin, they managed to follow the tracks of Bigfoot for about a mile before making plaster casts of them. This was also filmed, but the footage has since been lost. Patterson wasted no time in getting his film developed, and while it was difficult to get many scientists interested in the footage, he did, he did find success showing it on talk shows, where it garnered national attention, leading to many interviews and articles for Patterson, with Bob Gimlin preferring to stay out of the spot spotlight. Patterson died from cancer only a few years later, in 1972, at the age of 38. The Bigfoot in the footage, referred to as Patty, has been a major talking point in the field of cryptozoology ever since, with advocates on both sides either stating it's a man in a suit or it couldn't possibly be a man in a suit. We'll talk about the naysayers later. But we're in the pro-Bigfoot part at the moment, so let's go with this. Go into this with an open mind. Okay, Katie. Okay, look, I'll pretend that it's real. Just keep an open mind. And by pretends, I mean, oh yeah, I'm definitely open to thinking this is real. I am, I am. Look, if there is something that I find convincing, I'm happy to be convinced. That's what I always say. I do. I make fun of not having an, having an open mind, but I genuinely want to be persuaded of this stuff. I genuinely, like, if ghosts are real, I'd really like to know. I just think it's extremely unlikely, and I've never seen any ghosts. I don't believe anyone else has seen any ghosts. There's no evidence of ghosts. Would I like ghosts to be real? Fuck yeah, that'd be fun. Let's go. I just need something more. And it's at this moment, <laughs> the, in the footage, a ghost appears by me. Yeah, oh my God, it's real and I have the footage. And then no one will believe me because they'll be like, it's faked. And it probably would be because, or it would just be in my imagination and no one be able to see it because ghosts aren't real. Let's carry on. I'll just put in here that I assume the name Patty was short for Patterson, but Patterson's wife was named Patricia or Patty. Patty Patterson, that's great. Patty, Patty Patterson. So I guess he named the Squatch after his wife. Is this flattering? I think not. Wait, he also called the <laughs> What are you doing? Bastard. Can you imagine going on? He's like, are they named it Patty after Patterson? And she'll be like, you know, my name's Patty, right? He's a big, ugly monster. He'll be like, oh, I see where I've gone wrong. Oh, no. Anyway, the Patterson Gimlin film is arguably the most famous piece of evidence confirming the existence of an elusive, hairy, ape like creature living in the depths of the forest. It's also one of the most scrutinized pieces of film ever shot. It was made in 1967, and while filmmaking, monster movies, and special effects were very much in existence, nobody had doubted that the film showed something that was physically there in the woods, i.e., no camera trickery was involved. So, what are our eyes telling us? Patty the Bigfoot quite casually walks into the woods, taking a few backward glances at our man Patterson. In case you are wondering why it's been designated a female Bigfoot, it's because you can see some big old hairy boobs when it turns around. The obvious answer to the mystery is that it's just a man in an ape suit. However, investigations at the time and more recently seem to suggest that it isn't. Okay. For one, no zipper or other fasteners have been seen on the Bigfoot. There's not, that's not to say they aren't there. The footage is pretty grainy after all, but if it is a suit, it's a pretty good one. In fact, it's a damn good one. Patty moves naturally, not like anyone in a cumbersome costume, and her mouth and features appear to move or when she turns her head, not like if she was just in a costume and mask. The footage has been digitally enhanced over the years, and if anything, it decreases the likelihood that this is just an ape suit. Muscle movement can be seen under the hair, and researchers have been able to clearly pinpoint various muscle groups. Impossible if it was just a suit. Okay, holy 
If that's legit, if that is legit research that has happened, that's making me think, okay, well, it's not a man in a suit. Like the muscle movements underneath. I mean, the face movements of the mask, sure, maybe. But back in the day, and that's a fancy suit, I'm like pretty skeptical about that. But the muscle, bu- muscle movements underneath, I, I mean, the zipper and stuff is old footage. But the muscle groups and this kind of stuff, that seems pretty legit to be in. Like, I don't think it's a Bigfoot or whatever still. I just think it's a big gorilla or something. Dr. Jürgen Konzak, the associate director of the Human Sensory Model Lab at the University of Minnesota, did an experiment to see whether a human could really match the walking gait of the so-called Bigfoot. In 2004, using a big, strong, sporty type and an optical electronic camera system, he compared the human trying to recreate the walk to the motion of Patty in the film. For another angle, he was joined by paleoanthropologist Esteban Saramen, an expert in large wild apes who worked at the American Museum of Natural History. Konzak reports, If you look at this gate, uh, we can clearly see that it's not the walk of a large ape that we know today. Saramento, Saramiento says, It's that he doesn't walk like a human, and he doesn't walk like an ape. The athlete was unable to replicate the Bigfoot walk, and it seemed that the movement seen on film just couldn't be made by a guy in a potentially bulky and cumbersome suit. Konzak concluded that it was not possible for a human or even a giant ape to be able to walk like the Bigfoot, in the Patterson Gimlin film. Very interesting. There, I'm, I'm getting a little bit persuaded. This is very nice. The plaster casts made by Patterson and Gimlin also pointed to the existence of a very large bipedal creature. From the depth of the footprint casts they made, it was estimated that Patty weighed around 700 pounds or 317 kilos. There was also evidence of a midfoot pressure ridge, indicating flexibility in the midfoot, which corresponds to the gait of Patty and the terrain she lives in and is not a feature of a modern-day human footprint. I feel like the footprints we know, or there was, there was definitely some faking of footprints going on, in this, in this story at some point, because I remember them like being sold or whatever. There was some kid's footprint toy or whatever, and people were doing it. But maybe that was afterwards. So apart from this short film, what other evidence do we have? As usual, humans have just muddied the waters for ourselves now after the Patterson-Gimlin footage was released. So the idea of Bigfoot was introduced to the public consciousness and they started popping up all over the place, including in the world of entertainment. My personal introduction was the film Bigfoot and the Hendersons which I believe is called Hen- Harry and the Hendersons in the US. I feel like I've definitely heard of Bigfoot and the Hendersons. It's possible I've even seen that. I have vague memories of this. It's one of those films that I must have seen at a very impressionable age, as I remember a lot about it, despite not having watched it for probably at least 30 years. Oh, I don't remember much about it. I vaguely remember what the Bigfoot looked like, and even that could just be a false memory. It's possible I've never seen this. I also remember being in floods of tears at the end, which led to my dad grumbling about taking his daughters out for a nice treat at the cinema, only now to have to deal with my emotional breakdown. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> anyway, anybody can say that they've seen a Bigfoot or felt a weird presence when they've been out camping in the woods, but it's the sheer number of recorded encounters, thousands of witness statements, that has catapulted Bigfoot from the realms of are you insane to hang on a minute, maybe there's something out there after all. I have to say, I'm kind of into the hangout a minute. There's maybe something out there after all. Okay, category. Like, is that muscle groups thing? That is really compelling. If that is true, if scientists have actually looked in that film and been like, there's like twitching muscles under there, that is legit. I'm sorry, that is some fairly, that is fairly good evidence of like that being, uh, and, and how do you define a Bigfoot anyway? What if it's just some like funky ape, some like birth defect ape or something that's just got its body a little bit wrong? Something like that. But then why is it in the the forest? And where are the rest of them? Where where did it come from? And it's this knife's edge that the Squatch is balancing on that makes it so irresistible to this day. There's been no conclusive proof that it exists, but there has also been no conclusive proof that it doesn't. Look at the Bigfoot map in Project website confirms that sightings are alive and well, and interestingly, not to be confined to the Pacific Northwest, traditionally thought to be the Squatch's chief stomping grounds. In fact, there look to be as many, if not more, sightings in Kentucky, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Despite all these encounters, we still don't have verifiable proof in the way of physical evidence such as confirmed Sasquatch hair, the remains of a dead Sasquatch, or even a decent photo. So, why do so many people believe it's real? And are we any closer to unraveling the mystery? Yeah, the lack of dead ones and stuff is just like... It's, I, I want the muscle group thing to be explained because that's the only thing I'm getting hung up on so far. Everything else, like the way it walks and shit. I'm like, okay, so a dude did one study with one dude. That's not good enough. But the scientist looking at the muscle twitching, that is sticking up to me as needs explanation. 
Well, the fact is, you can't convince people of what they did or did not see. Some people have based their belief in real-life Bigfoots because of stories told to them by older family members who had kept it all on the hush-hush for, being fear of, for fear of being ridiculed. The fact that they chose to keep the story to themselves somehow makes it more believable to the few people they do tell it to. There are many, many examples of experienced campers, hikers, wilderness experts, animal experts, scientists, you name it, who have had some sort of brush with a Bigfoot, or at least some entity that they couldn't ex understand or or explain. While most of the evidence for the existence of Bigfoot is purely anecdotal, the Patterson-Gimlin film stands still confounds skeptics who cannot write it off as a hoax to the satisfaction of the believer contingent. Yeah, not surprised. The muscle thing. And I know I keep bringing it up, but that's the thing. Bigfoot in the 20th, 21st century. Bigfoot is still big news today, and Squatch and Co. regularly make the rounds in kids' movies and TV shows, uh, but have there been any recent Bigfoot updates? I want to talk about the BFRO for a moment. This is the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, which was established in 1995, and according to their website, works with, quote, scientists, journalists, and specialists from diverse backgrounds. The overall mission of BFRO is multifaceted, but the organization essentially seeks to resolve the mystery surrounding the Bigfoot phenomena, that is, to derive conclusive documents documentation of the species' existence. The goal is pursued through the proactive collection of empirical data and physical evidence from the field and by means of activities designed to promote an awareness and understanding of the nature and origin of the evidence. Okay, so that sounds really good. I know I made fun of these guys earlier, it's kind of wasting their time, but these seem like to be doing proper scientific stuff. But then why are you plotting on a map all the places that people were like, I saw a Bigfoot there, because that's not science. That's just like... Sounds like fun. You can't separate the fact from fiction doing something like that. But like empirical data, physical evidence, that kind of stuff, that is legit and cool. Good for you. But have you ever found anything? How long have you been doing this? Didn't they say since like the 19... Yeah, 1995. What have you found in that time? Uh, as far as I'm aware, that um, Patterson film or whatever is... That is the most conclusive evidence that we have of Bigfoot. And there's, if there was something more conclusive, we'd have talked about it already. So what have you been doing? Hmm... Big words, but have they come up with any goods? Well, yes and no. While there is lots of information about the Squatch's appearance, preferred habitat, and behavior on the site, all of this is just compiled from alleged eyewitness accounts. Yeah, which isn't science. There are no convincing photos, videos, or anything at all, really. There are some links to audio recordings of supposed Bigfoot vocalizations, but none of these are from the last couple of decades. One is described as siren-like, and that's because, well, it just sounds like a siren. All the eyewitness accounts have been lumped together and averaged out to create a supposed profile of the creature known as Bigfoot. It's all presented as fact with a huge depth of detail down to how a Bigfoot poos. So here you go. Quote, their feces are sausage-shaped, up to four inches in diameter and up to three feet long, forming a folding heap. They are replete with numerous intestinal parasites, including hookworms, as well as small bones, hair of prey, and ample vegetal matter. A Sasquatch has been observed to wipe itself with its hands and lick its fingers briefly. A decidedly simian gesture. <laughs> oh man, wait, the simian, are they licking their poo off their fingers and hands after wiping their butt with their hands? What the fuck? That's the last thing you want to do. That's gross. I also don't believe that one. And anyway, primates will eat poop if there's anything worth salvaging in there, but they don't wipe their butts with their hands and then lick them clean, so don't tar other simians with your pooey brush. Okay, good. Yeah, that would just seem like that's, uh, that's disease. That's asking for diseases, isn't it? For me, the BFRO occupies a weird space of trying to prove the existence of Bigfoot, but providing people with enough of a platform that it all ends up just sounding pretty ridiculous. It doesn't help that the founder of the BFRO is a man called Matt Moneymaker, although that is his real name, so I suppose we should hold it against him. His real name is actually Moneymaker. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> the only thing better be like Rainmaker, Mr. Rainmaker. Make it rain, baby! And guess what his dad's name is? Richard Moneymaker. No, it's not. His name is Rich Moneymaker. Oh my god, he's a lawyer. How on the nose could he get? His name is Rich Moneymaker. That's fucking golden. The BFRO holds regular field expeditions to sites of recent Squatch activity, and in one such trip that was filmed for a show called Animal X, they set up a mud trap with a load of fruit in it so, to see if they could get any evidence of Squatchy activity. 
The next morning, there was an impression in the mud of which a plaster cast was made, and this became known as the Skookum Cast, after the Skookum Meadows area of Washington State, where the group were. Apparently, this is an impression made by a Bigfoot as it tried to get the fruit. To be honest, it's hardly a clear print, and it's pretty impossible to know what you're supposed to be looking at. The best reconstruction the crew could come up with was showing a Squatch kind of lying propped up on its side in the mud, forlornly reaching for some mucky berries in the middle. Of course, I'm no expert in Sasquatch, but it didn't really seem like a natural thing for Bigfoot to be doing. I was expecting some big footprints in the mud, not some weird wallowing shape as the creature inexplicably decided to lie down and pull itself towards some food. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there was just a dent in the grounds and you've tried to make it work to, you know, what's it called when you come up with a theory and then you do everything you can to try and prove the theory rather than being objective? I don't know, but it sounds like that's what's going on here. Was any Bigfoot hair found? No. Were any large footprints found? Or a three-foot long heaped poo? No. Could this imprint have been made by, say, another animal, such as an elk, as they were known to create similar shapes while lying down? Well, yes, that's a yes. Also, there were elk tracks nearby. Surely the obvious thing to have done was to have a flipping camera set up near the mud trap, but I guess that wouldn't have helped the BFRO out very much. Can't we just be objective? Also, what are those cameras called? The light that the, um... They're like cameras that you set up in trees, and then they take a picture when there's motion, like hunting cameras or trap cameras or whatever. I suppose another blow to the credibility of the BFRO is that it spawned off a TV show on Animal Planet called Finding Bigfoot that lasted for 100 episodes. The money spinning, like whoever Mr. Money Spinner at uh, Animal Planet is, is just crazy. Like, the fact that you can spin this out for so long. Or like that, uh, the, the mystery of Oak Island treasure or whatever that History Channel's been doing for like 400 seasons or whatever. It's just, how can you spin something out that long? I was reading about that. I think I stumbled across that on Reddit the other day. Someone talking about Oak Island as being like a mystery or whatever and how they kept digging down in that hole and finding things. And I'm just reading that being like, no, 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 no. You just watched the History Channel thing and you thought it was real. And the comment below is like, yeah, this is obviously fake. Um, It's just made up, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, legend. And I'm pretty sure that second one had more upvotes. So it's just like, good, good. Don't believe everything you see on the History Channel, but believe everything you see on any of my channels. Everything. Never, qu never question me. <laughs> Just joking, you can question me. It's what the comments are for. Did they find Bigfoot? Well, I'll let you take a wild guess. It's also rated a dismal 4 out of 10 on IMDb. That's really bad for IMDb, meaning that there doesn't seem to even be any entertainment value to it at all. I watched a bit of an episode in which the team are trying to work out if someone's managed to capture a photo of Bigfoot on their trail camera, and thankfully, they have a dedicated skeptic on the team who spends the whole time asserting that it is just a bear. Well, that's great. I like that. How did you spin it off to 100 episodes, though? Because the skeptic person is every episode. No, 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 no. And that's the format. Although, yes, most TV shows are fairly formulaic, so never mind. Matt Moneymaker is also a team maker, as is the most stoned looking guy on television, James Faye, who is nicknamed Bobo. Uh, stone, most stoned looking guy in your opinion, Katie. Mm, careful. This whole thing is probably not worth watching now, as if evidence of Bigfoot were found, it's unlikely to exist only on this show and not be big news all around the world, but maybe just watch it for Bobo. <laughs> Katie's included a picture of Bobo, who, uh, yeah, in my opinion, also does look fairly stoned. Decoding Bigfoot. All right, let's get to the part where we delve even deeper into the story of Sasquatch. There's no denying that the idea of the Sasquatch has existed in First Nations and American culture for hundreds of years. This has led to people believing that there must be something to this story of a large, hairy, wild man or half man, half ape or giant ape. That's not necessarily true. I suppose it's easier to believe this must have roots in reality as the figure itself is bipedal and human-like, so basically something that we could all easily recognize and something that could potentially exist. Yeah, it's not like oh, it's, it's an alien or a monster, like, you know, something that's completely wild-ass different. It's like if someone saw a unicorn in the forest, at least you'd be like, well, okay, I can imagine it's sort of a horse with like a weird, weird skull or something, like a white horse that's somewhat a little bit sparkly with a big, you know, horn pointing out of its head. That could be like a birth defect or something. If you take a look at other legends, there are plenty of absolutely bonkers demons and concepts out there that in no way could exist in the real world and nobody has ever really claimed they do. I'm thinking, for instance, of the Kasha Yokai, or Japanese demon, that was covered in the Kasha House of Kaimuki episode. The origin of that demon was that it was a fiery or burning cart that popped up at people's funerals if they weren't particularly nice people, and then it drove them to hell. 
yeah, that's not something that I would ever question. Like in the episodes, like obviously fake, obviously fake, obviously fake. Whereas this one with the muscle thing, I'm like, well, it's not obviously fake, is it? I don't think there's enough evidence to say that it's real, but it's not obviously fake like a fiery chariot that drives people to hell. Nobody's suggesting they've ever seen this happening or it was a real thing. So why should we believe in Bigfoot just because it's presented as something a bit more familiar? Well, well, partly because things that are more familiar and close to reality are more likely to be reality. I'm going to go back to our examples of pro-Bigfoot evidence now and see what the whole story was. Yes, this may be seen as spoiling the fun, and some people complain that stories are ruined when we actually investigate a bit further, but hello, this is decoding the unknown. The clue is in the name. We need to look at both sides of this hairy coin. Although in reality, this is a hairy coin that just keeps spinning as no matter how much debunking is done, the debunking is then apparently debunked, etc, etc, etc. Yeah, maybe this, like sometimes I see people like reacting to my videos and stuff, they'll be like, you know, they watch it and they react to it. Sometimes it's entertaining, sometimes it's a bit boring. Uh, but this won't be good. I'd like to see some, you know, person who really believes in this being like, yeah, Simon Burby's all about this. Although I'm quite on the fence about this, to be honest. I mean, if you were reacting to like the, the the burning chariot of fire one or whatever, it'd be like, well, actually, the burning chariot of fire is real. <laughs> Please, come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. Don't be silly. The origin of the name Bigfoot came from media reports of the footprints found by Jerry Crew and chums around the site of their logging operation. How do we account for these massive one-third of Danny DeVito-sized prints? Well, if you go straight to the debunking without passing go, these prints were nothing more than a not particularly sophisticated prank carried out by a guy on the same team using a wooden foot imprint. Ray Wallace allegedly made a deathbed confession in 2002 admitting to the prank, although it wasn't exactly a secret to his family and friends. He was well known as a prankster, and in 1958 apparently decided that time was right for North America to have his own version of the Yeti, or to at least increase the interest in it. <sighs> kind of a legend, to be honest. It's like, yeah. Guy, it's, it's a good prank. It's pretty funny. Some people thought that there was no way it could have just been a man with a wooden footprint as there were supposedly not enough time for people to do this sort of malarkey with all the work that they had to do. But come on, how long does it take to press a foot on a pole and into how but come on how long does it take to press a foot on a pole into some mud not very long and also have you not heard of procrastination people are saying this is like yeah yeah we should be logging but we just fucked around for a little bit like everybody with any job ever not very long and the other large heavy things that apparently were mysteriously moved around the camp might have been moved by machinery without other people's knowledge they might have been on unstable ground and slid over or maybe it was just a made-up fact to get their name in the local paper the bfro have decided the wallace did not in fact make this confession i found an article in the los angeles time from times from december the 6th 2002 where wallace's son michael confirmed that his dad had been behind the mysterious footprints okay the bfro were correct in that wallace didn't exactly make a deathbed confession but apparently he polled his family as he knew his health was failing and they all voted for not holding on to the secret as previously mentioned it wasn't like he was the only one who knew the whole time this seems to be a weird thing for a random person to say to a paper 44 years after the event unless they were actually involved in some way and it's not like this example has ever been as remotely famous as the patterson gimlin film so i doubt michael wallace was cashing in much on that hairy coin yeah he's just a prankster and then he got out of control and he's like cool just you know last fun thing before i die I, it was me and people would be like no it wasn't still real still real i believe it bfro we built a career around this mr money spinner and i money spinner at animal planet it's a joke other naysayers of this explanation have said that the alleged foot stomper ray wallace did not match the plaster cast taken by jerry crew to that i say whatever the ground was muddy while it's probably didn't plant it down exactly level each time and maybe the cast wasn't taken very well i also have trouble finding verifiable pictures of what the fake feet looked like the one on the bfro site looks very different to the one on the site called bigfootencounters.com so maybe wallace had multiple versions or maybe these debunks of the debunk are just wrong to be honest i believe that this incident was a hoax as why would you bother confessing to something like this just before you die you wouldn't get any credit or attention for it as you'd be dead and credit and attention is what people who make false confessions are after pretending that your dad perpetrated a long forgotten hoax is hardly going to do much to increase your profile in the 21st century so personally i think wallace and possibly other people in his work team were all just having a laugh and i completely fully agree with you katie there's very little doubt in my mind on that one now let's get into the nitty-gritty of the patterson gimlin film 
excellence. Although Katie writes sigh, so I get the feeling that it's going to be debunked. Which will be good, because the muscle thing isn't explained yet, and I'd like to know what the explanation is, please. Okay, this is going to take a while. Every point can be met with a counter by die-hard believers, so let's just go for it. First off, the original film has disappeared and only copies remain. This means that we can't say for sure when it was filmed and if there was any other footage before the main event that might give us a bit more of an idea of, it all, of its authenticity. And perhaps the timeline around the making of the film, rather than the footage itself, is what could prove to be its undoing. Interesting. Let me explain. Patterson and Gimlin were trekking through the forest on horseback on the afternoon of October the 20th, 1967. Patterson stated that they chanced upon the Bigfoot somewhere between 1.15 and 1.40 p.m. Any timestamps that could be found on the original film have, of course, been lost. After the close encounter, which could only have lasted a couple of minutes, both men had to round up their horses, which had been spooked at the presence of Bigfoot, and run off. They spent some time trying to track down Patty through the forest for anywhere between one and three miles. During this time, Patterson filmed some of the footprints that had been found, but the film has also been lost. After losing sight of any more tracks, they headed back to their campsite, which was three miles or 4.8 kilometers away. They picked up some plaster to make casts with and went the three miles or 4.8 kilometers back to the footprints, made the casts, waited for said casts to dry, went the three miles or 4.8k back to the camp again, packed everything up into the trailer, including the horses, and drove to Willow Creek to mail the film off. The film was mailed at about 6.30 p.m. Does it sound likely that all of this could have been done in five hours? Uh, I know the answer's supposed to be no, but they were on horses. Three miles is not that far on a horse. And plaster doesn't take that long to set. So I have to say the answer could be yes. I think not unreasonable. It was quick, but it doesn't sound crazy. I should also mention that from their camp to Willow Creek was about 24 miles or 40 kilometers, men, most long dirt tracks and fire roads. Okay, that's going to take forever. Because like 24 miles, or what, 60, 60 miles an hour, is 24 minutes. Which, that is not short. But doing it on the track is going to take five times longer. So let's just say it's an hour and a half. Two hours, maybe. Let's just say two hours. So they did all the stuff in three hours. Now that's sounding a bit more ridiculous. So yeah, once you start looking at it like that, the whole thing seems to be getting more and more unlikely. It didn't help matters that Patterson changed his story a few times, even saying that the film was flown to Yakima on a charter plane to be developed, oh, and it was later proven that no charter planes flew that day because of bad weather. Uh-oh, why are you lying? A plane seems like a pretty big thing to suddenly remember, and in fact, it is this dubious timeline coupled with Patterson's shifting story that convinces me that the footage is just a hoax rather than going into the nitty-gritty of the actual Bigfoot you see. Speaking of which, let's get into the nitty-gritty of the actual Bigfoot you see. Old Patty swing her arms and boobs around like nobody's business, ambling off between the trees and into infamy. Uh, there are two possibilities here. Number one, it's a real Bigfoot. Number two, it's a man wearing a costume. Which of these is most likely? I'll say that having watched rather more videos than I wanted to about this, I was starting to think maybe there was something to this Bigfoot thing. The footage has been enhanced over the years, and while the original was quite grainy, it's possible to see muscles moving under the fur, worn patches, a moving face, details that a hoaxer throwing a fake movie together in the 1960s wouldn't have time or resources to create. But is it really possible to see that? Australian Wayne Dowsent made a video showing the 4K version of the film, pointing out that Patty the Bigfoot moves and saying things like, Go on, Simon, try an Aussie accent here to be authentic. The muscles move and quiver. That's not that that's Australian. This is Australian. I mean it's not a good one, but it isn't it is it is probably recognizable as Australian. I know all the Australians are super upset. The muscles move and quiver as they act like shock absorbers. The muscles move and quiver as they act like shock absorbers. But for the life of me, I can't see what he's talking about. The footage is clearer, and this does actually make it look more like an actual creature than a suited up guy, but I can't really see all this detail that he and others have pointed out. Dowson also points out how similar the head is compared to real ape. But isn't that what you'd expect from an ape costume? The nose appears to be different, but there's not really any clear shot of it. And in the enhanced version, when Patty turns to the camera, that's actually when the face looks the least realistic, mainly because of the odd nose. Dowsant also points out wear marks on the creature's hair, presumably from its arms constantly brushing past its thighs, etc., but maybe it's just a patchy costume. Hardly a death blow to the skeptics. Other people have made much of the way Patty moves as it's not the way a human or indeed an ape would walk. Wait, so let's just go back. So that previous thing is just like, before it was scientists have done the muscle group tracking and all of this, and it's like, nah, nah, it just looks like they're real muscles under there. So it turns out to just not be as solid as, as you first think, which is kind of what I expected, to be honest. 
Is it, though, the way a human in an ape suit would walk? I take major issue with Dr. Jurgen Konzak's experiment with the optical cameras on the athlete. He concluded that a human could not walk like a Bigfoot, but what I concluded was that that particular human could not walk like Bigfoot. Exactly, I said it's done on one person. One person is not a study. They had him angled or weirdly, moving his arms and legs into positions to match the Bigfoot when he wasn't the same proportions as the creature on the screen. Everybody walks totally differently depending on a number of factors. If you're familiar with someone, you can sometimes pick them out in a crowd by the way they walk. I personally used to overthink how to swing my arms because I thought everyone was looking at me. This is when I was young and insecure, now I don't give a crap. I tried to recreate the Bigfoot walk in my own room and probably did a better job than the test subjects. They should have just shown the athlete guy the footage and asked him to try and walk like that. Or maybe they should have just put him in a football helmet and shoulder pads, zipped him up into an ape suit, and told him to take a stroll through the trees. Because of its notoriety, several slightly odd people throughout the years have outed themselves as being the person inside the Bigfoot suit. Okay, I thought it was one of the original guys or something, but it just turns out to be a bunch of... I like not... Eh, maybe it could have been one of them. One dude filming, one dude in the ape suit, or a third person. But like most people have come out of it like it was me. Prove it. The one with the most credibility, however, is Bob... Hieronymus. He was the neighbor of Bob Gimlin and in 1967 was offered a thousand dollars to wear the suit and be in the film. That's a lot of money in 1967, isn't it? Like ten times more? Because I was watching Mad Men and then I was wondering how expensive shit was and it was basically just like add a zero to the end. A little bit less than that. And that's how much money it is in today's money. Um, that's around nine thousand dollars today. Not bad for a minute's work. That seems very unlikely. Why would you pay someone ex such an extraordinary amount of money? According to Hieronymus, he tried on the suit a couple of times with the football helmets and shoulder pads underneath. Then he went with Patterson and Gimlin to the forest and made the clip. He was never paid any money, and instead of outing the whole thing early on, he was scared of the backlash that he would receive because the film had attracted so much attention. Dude, you just got stiffed out of nine grand? Fuck that. Hieronymus was worried that he'd be prosecuted for fraud, so he kept his mouth shut until a few decades later. Who are you defrauding? No one, you're not tricking anyone out of money here. You're just making a prank film. There's a YouTube video showing Bob walking. And if I'd just been convinced convinced by the awkward athlete that Bigfoots were real, it took an old man shuffling across the screen to convince me that Bigfoots aren't real. Or at least the Patterson Gimlin film is not real. Sure, it's not the exact Bigfoot walk, but Bob's an old man now and he wasn't togged up in an ape suit. Wearing a full body suit with big feet does totally affect your gait, as I can attest, having dressed up as the children's character Poppycat to help out a friend who managed a bookshop. Man, it was sweaty inside. Thankfully, there were two of us on duty and I wore the costume first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing worse than like putting on someone else's sweaty clothes or whatever, like or mask and stuff. And I don't know, I used to do theater and, and all of that stuff. And you know, if you're doing something where you have to wear like a mask and it's like someone else has wear that mask and you put it on and it's like damp inside from their breath, you're like, oh, this is horrible. I hated that. There's footage of Bob and a group of pals at a bar laughing about how anyone was fooled and it's common knowledge around town that it was just Bobby H in a suit. He even took a lie detector test on a show called Guess What? Lie Detector in 2005 which confirmed that he wasn't lying uh, when he said that he was the guy in the Bigfoot suit. Yeah, but lie detectors are just bullshit. This isn't really conclusive proof though as lie detectors basically measure stress levels, not lies. It's also kind of a niche spot to make this statement, although Hieronymus I have no idea if I'm pronouncing this right, name right, but it sounds he sounds like some sort of Greek, doesn't he? Or like, you know, Aristotle, Herostratus, I think is the, the guy. He's, or Herodotus, the historian. Herostratus, the guy who burned down that temple just so he'd be remembered by history. Um, Hieronymus. Interesting. Uh, look, he wasn't coming out with the information with a bang, just confirming what he'd say, been saying for a while against any doubters. According to the Wikipedia page about the show, the other two people featured on the episode were employee who wants to prove that her pay was legitimate and a man who wants to prove that he did not murder his girlfriend. What the fuck, man? That is a crazy show. And also, what do you mean? Employee wants to prove that her pay was legitimate. <laughs> It's that my pay is legitimate. I worked six hours and I got paid for six hours. Okay. And next up, did John murder his girlfriends? In a... That is just a hard left, isn't it? Holy shit. As with everything in this story, you either believe Bob or you don't. So, what's the next sticking point? How about that suit? Of course, this isn't just an ape suit or a gorilla suit. There's no way that a costume could be that good in the 1960s. If it was, it would have cost a bomb uh, way more than Patterson could afford. 
Oh yeah? Could have been that good, eh? Well, one comparison I saw somewhere uh, was that around the time that the footage came out, the first Planet of the Apes film with Charles and Heston was made, the critics said that there was no way the Bigfoot suit was fake as the best Hollywood could come up with at the time uh, was not very convincing apes in Planet of the Apes. Well, I beg to differ. I looked up clips and stills from the 1968 movie, and while all the apes I saw were wearing clothes, the makeup was actually pretty good. The faces moved, and with a couple of exceptions, they weren't too mask-like or really fake-looking. The hair looked pretty good, and the conclusion that I came to is that it was more than possible to create a decent full-body Bigfoot suit in the late 1960s. John Chambers actually received an honorary Oscar for outstanding makeup achievements in this film, so there you go. He is denied being behind the Bigfoot suit, though. Yeah, but it just proves that it's totally possible, though. So, who did make it? It's unlikely that it was just an off-the-peg gorilla number. Apparently, it was made by Philip and Amy Morris, who made gorilla suits mainly used in carnival shows. While there were no receipts coming from the sale to be found and the suit itself has never surfaced, both Philip and Amy confirm that, the Patters- that Patterson commissioned the suit from them and called up sometime later to ask how it could be modified to appear bigger. Dude, this is some... I, I mean... The evidence for is like very weak, and the evidence against is just like there seems to be a lot of stuff saying that this is clearly fake, doesn't it? Philip Morris also pointed out this is a Philip Morris, like the the, uh, the the cigarette company. Hey Siri, what's Philip Morris? Hey, it's a tobacco company. Quiet, Siri. Pipe down. That's quite enough. No. I'm not your slave. Philip Morris also pointed out how wearing the suit could alter a person's walking gait and that the suit wasn't designed to be particularly flexible, hence Patty the Bigfoot having to turn her entire upper body to look behind her. I also found a photograph on BBC website showing members of the Starless tribe during a Sasquatch festival and someone's wearing a Sasquatch suit and I don't know whether it came from real animal hide. I presume it did, but it looks pretty good quality costume and that was from 1938. Yeah, the idea that it wasn't possible to make a good costume is just silly. There were great costumes chill. So, could the most famous footage be just a man in a suit? I think it's definitely possible, if not probable. I'll round out this section by saying that Patton himself was something of a tricky customer. He got financing from a film company called American National Enterprises to make a fake Bigfoot documentary, mainly based on a tiny tome he had self-published called Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? Patterson used the money to buy the ape suit and rent the camera that he used for the encounter. After getting the film developed and selling the clip himself, he cut ties with American National Enterprises enterprises who didn't get anything out of the relationship. Can't they sue him for the original money at least? Like, you should give that original money back. You just completely abandoned it, dude. Patterson was also arrested for keeping the camera longer than the rental period. Arrested? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I should return my library books. Police, open up! <laughs> Although he eventually gave it back in one piece and the charges were dropped. Yes, Patterson did end up raking in the money. Although there were lawsuits further down the line, his wife ended up with 100% of the TV rights and 49% of the rights of the film footage. All, along with his brother-in-law, who helped Patterson out financially before, it's estimated they made about $200,000 off the footage in the first year alone in 1960s money. Holy shit. They made... Oh, uh, oh there's a figure here. and That's $1.7 million today. But even if that was adjusted for inflation, that but even if that wasn't adjusted for inflation, it's not bad. Holy shit, they made some bank. God damn. Patterson may have also known he was dying. He had Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it's not totally out of the question that he just had one last hurrah and struck gold with the escapade. Or it could be that as a Bigfoot fanboy, he miraculously did what no one had convincingly done before or since and actually had an encounter with the real creature that he managed to capture on film. Maybe you're not convinced that Bigfoot is a hoax, but you think there might be something setting off all of these reports. Well, a lot of so-called Bigfoot encounters can be explained as encounters with other normal and boring animals like bears. Bears can stand on their hind legs and, and walk around if they want to, and some of them are really big, making them an easy target for Bigfoot misidentification. Also, a lot of reported encounters happen at night in the woods, so people tend to stay inside their tents and not go poking around outside, i.e. they don't see anything useful. Yeah, if I hear like crazy sounds, would you? out camping it's like i know that there's just a it's just a paper thin fabric between you and whatever monster is out there but it's like i'm not going outside i don't want to i'm safe in here it's definitely safe under the blankets oh damn the vocalizations that people hear could be any number of animals or other man-made sounds coming from unexpected directions. In the Portlock, Alaska episodes, there were references to a wild, hairy man in the woods, and people were reported as hearing women's voices that didn't seem to be speaking in any language they knew. These 
There are First Nations people in Alaska and Canada, and their many languages would be totally unfamiliar to practically everyone else. And maybe they just heard the locals walking past having a bit of a natter. It's also possible that Bigfoot hunters are fooling each other, making calls that they think attract Bigfoots, they're then replied to by another group thinking they've just heard of Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Classic. That happened in England a while ago with two men down the ends of their respective gardens thinking they were communicating with an owl on a regular basis, but there was no owl. John, is that you? <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine? This, so, discounting a Sasquatch and other regular wildlife, could there be something else in the mix? How about some sort of real giant ape that's managed to survive relatively undisturbed all this time? Gigantopithecus, okay, was a real ape, a very large one, judging by the jawbones and teeth that have been found, but is it likely to still be alive and well and undiscovered hundreds of thousands of years after it was supposed to go extinct? No, because there's no evidence, there's no skeletons, there's no bodies, there's no so, like real sightings or evidence or anything like that, because obviously the Peterson film, Patterson film, whatever, is not real. Um, it's been debunked, in my opinion. So, no, it's not real. It died a long time ago and it's never come back. And not only that, there's got to be enough of them to keep breeding if they still exist today. A more likely explanation might be that actual gorillas or similar apes might be living in the forest, maybe having escaped from zoos or private collections, or being dumped there by people who couldn't look after them anymore. Gorillas don't usually walk on their hind legs, though, preferring to knuckle walk on all fours. In lots of cases where people can't identify an animal in a trail photo, though, it usually just turns out to be a bear. Hoaxes. I know we haven't really mentioned any of the confirmed Bigfoot hoaxes, and that's because, well, what's the point? Uh, they were found out, or the perpetrators admitted to the hoax. Usually the dead squatch or whatever was discovered was made of latex, rubber, or other animal hair, and it just served to undermine the possibility of Bigfoot being real. People have even died after being shot while dressing up a Bigfoot, so it's not something that I really recommend. And I know there's going to be people in the comments saying that they or their dad, uncle, grandfather had weird experiences that they couldn't explain, and I'm not trying to belittle what you went through. Um, yeah, but it does make it real. I saw Father Christmas in my room as a young child, and it always struck me as strange that my parents wouldn't have bothered getting togged up. And it always struck me as strange that my parents wouldn't have bothered getting togged up to put stuff in my stocking if I was already supposed to be asleep. Yet this image is in my mind, and while I've since been promoted to the role of Santa myself, I've never been able to fully believe that this is a false memory. And no, it wasn't some pervert that had broken in, at least I hope it wasn't, and I've actually been repressing something horrible the whole time. Jesus Christ, that got dark. I'm pretty sure he was just putting some presents in my stocking. Anyway, my point was that while you might truly believe that it was a Bigfoot encounter, chances are... <laughs> It wasn't. There have been thousands and thousands of sightings, and yet not a single decent picture has come out of it. I've seen various YouTube videos claiming to be proof of Bigfoots, but that are either obviously fake or are really intriguing but then cut out at the crucial moments or are just plain weird. Nothing has captured the public's attention and imagination since the 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film, and now, even 56 years later, it hasn't been possible to thoroughly prove the film to be a hoax or the real deal. Logically, though we have found evidence of species thought to be extinct, we're still discovering new species even now, and yet nobody can find a physical trace of a gigantic hairy ape in the woods, and it's hardly for want of trying. It's kind of weird, though, in that the more I look into the original Patterson-Gimlin footage, the more fake it seems, especially the face. It looks just odd, but when you see the enhanced version, it does appear more genuine, probably because it's been enhanced. Like, if you asked an AI, or like one of these AI upscalers or whatever, to look into it, and it'll be like, well, that's a monkey or a gorilla, so I'm going to make it look more gorilla-like in my process. So it kind of, that's what it would do, no? Patterson himself said on his deathbed that he wished he had just shot the thing so he'd have a body to show instead of having to deal with critics all the time. Gimlin, for his part, was totally radio silent for about 30 years, but does pop up every now and then, just retelling the story of the day that he and his friend filmed a Bigfoot. So what have we learned here? Well, I've learned that the Bigfoot in the Cat Patterson-Gimlin film could not possibly be a human in a suit. I've also learned that it was a man called Bob in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I think we... I don't know, for me it's like it's a man in a suit. I thought that's what it was going in, and then it's just debunked, satisfactorily for me at least. 
I've learned there is no confirmed physical proof of the existence of a Bigfoot. I've also learned that there are thousands of reports of people seeing a Bigfoot. The BFRO site has thousands of recorded accounts searchable by state, and it may not come as a huge surprise to learn that the highest number of sightings they've recorded are from Florida. There's some crazy stuff that happens in Florida. It's also known locally as a skunk ape. There. Just in case you were wondering. I looked through some reports, and there are a huge number where a squatch is just walking along a road or down a hill in plain view and not hidden at all. So why is the only note of this on a slightly niche website? Could it be that people are just making stuff up? In an action that went above and beyond my usual efforts, I submitted a Bigfoot sighting in Los Angeles to the Bigfoot Mapping Project website and, publi and it published it. No questions asked. Oh no. I didn't dare send it to the BFRO though, as it looks like they follow up on quite a lot of these and I'm a terrible liar. So yes, I just muddied the waters with the boring tale of seeing a tall figure at the edge of some trees and it made some weird noises. I hasten to add that this was 100% made up, but it just shows how easy it is to submit a fake sighting. It took me about two minutes. Another amazing thing to come out of this episode is the amount of times I typed Bogfoot instead of Bigfoot. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah, there are some words that I don't know that I'll use. Like, I uh, have a, this is not interesting, but I run a channel. There's another channel that I do called Waro Graphics. And my short form for that is always Waro. So like when I'm typing like notes, I'll record a Waro video and it always autocorrects it to wars and it drives me potty. <laughs> I think I'm taking the coward's way out of this and not definitively saying that Bigfoot is real one way or the other, although I do think the Patterson Gimlin film is a hoax. I guess I'm like Fox Mulder in that I want to believe. Show me the proof of Bigfoot and I'll be as excited as the next person. Exactly. And I feel that this is the position that every human should have. Just wait for some, if something comes across that proves something that you thought was fal false real, be like, cool, interesting. I guess I was wrong. That's okay. Until then, sorry, but it don't really mean squatch. Yes, thank you for being here, listening, watching this episode. If you like it, click that like button, subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, leave me a review. That would be most welcome, and I'll see you next time.